Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for that awesome introduction. Um, and I guess by way of introduction for our lesson tonight, uh, I'm going to talk about something that I always use in an analogy uh, in my lessons. It seems like is Chick-fil-A. And if you were here last time I spoke last semester, I used an analogy about Chick-fil-A. And it feels like there's just so many lessons I learned from Chick-fil-A. And so one of those things that I learned uh, from working at Chick-fil-A is absolutely nobody likes to be told what to do, right? And nobody enjoys being told what to do. And I'm sure you're familiar with the process of how things go at Chick-fil-A. When you come through the drive-through, you know, they've got a couple lines, kids outside with iPads who are ready to take your order. And, you know, you pull up and they start taking your order. And when you're in the position of the one on iPad, sometimes you'll notice, oh man, there's a gap between the car of the, whose order I'm taking and the car in front of them. And so what you'll do is you'll say, hey, can I get you to just pull forward a little bit for me, right? Just, just to keep the line moving, to keep things flowing. I don't know what it is about that question, but people hate it for some reason. I mean, I've had people ignore me, not acknowledge the question I'm asking them. I've had people look me in the eyes and say no and continue ordering. I don't know what it is about that question, but people hate it because they hate being told what to do, right? But you know what we love? What we love is telling other people what to do, or at least I do. And one of my favorite people to tell what to do is my little sister. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. I, I love to reign over my little sister because she gets a little upset, you know, and I just like to keep her in check, remind her who the parent is, me, right? No, 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 but, but, but here's the deal. We, we love to tell other people what to do. And I, I, as I think about this idea of reigning, this idea of, of someone being in control, it reminds me of the song that we just sang, which is why we sang it. Reign in me, Lord, reign in me. I'll read you uh, the lyrics of the chorus again. It says this, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power. Over all my dreams and in my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again? And that's what I want us to talk about tonight. This idea of God reigning in our lives. And so our title for this evening is, Who Reigns in Your Kingdom? What is the highest power in your life? Because I think the highest power is whatever affects your decisions. Like the choices that you make on a day-to-day -day basis, the big decisions that you have to make throughout your life, whether it relates to relationships, finances, your job, all those things are a result of whatever the highest power is in your life. And so the question I want us to answer tonight is who reigns in your kingdom? Because as we think about our song, if you, if, if you really focus on it, the song is really just both a declaration to God that he is the supreme authority in your life and a request for him to continue leading your heart. And so let me ask you this. Can you sing the words of this song? I think a lot of times we, we find ourselves sitting in the pew, sitting in our chairs, singing the words to a song that we don't actually, A, understand, or, or B, we don't mean them. They don't apply to us. And if you think I'm wrong, think about the last time you sang, Oh, Night with Eben Pinion, right? Like, I have no idea what that means. But as we, we sing this song, we really just want to be able to focus on the words that we're saying and make sure that they actually apply to our lives. Because the message this song brings is your life as a Christian. This is what it should look like what your attitude towards God should look like. And so, as we explore this tonight, I want to bring us three points, three things that will ensure God reigns in our kingdom. And then hopefully by the end of this study tonight, we can be able to, next time that we sing that song, be able to sing it and realize that we really mean this, that we really want to live this out, that we really want God to reign in our kingdom and over all of our decisions. So, three points tonight. If you're taking notes, here's the first one. Choose him as king. Turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 17 in your Bibles. Deuteronomy 17. As you're turning over there, you know, if you think about um, the way that we decide who we want to lead us as a country, uh, you've always got usually two 
individuals, right, either a Republican or a Democrat, and you, you decide who you want to be your leader based on your values, right? Based on the standards you have, the things that you want to see them bring about, and the things that they promise. And so you say, I'm gonna take the things that they've promised and now line them up with my views and say, this is who I want to be my leader. This is who I want to be the leader of our country. And so as we look at Deuteronomy chapter 17, we see that the Israelites are in a similar situation. They're in a place where they need to choose a king, and they've decided, hey, it's time we start becoming like these other nations and uh, picking someone to rule over us. And so, Deuteronomy chapter 17, Moses gives some instructions as to how they should go about choosing a king. So let's look at verses 14 through 15 together, and this is what it says. Here's what Moses says. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, and have taken possession of it, and settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. Here's the key. Be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses. Not a king that meets their standards, right? Not, not someone who's about what they want. Not someone who, who meets what they think they need, but someone who meets God's standards. But, as we know, Throughout the entire Old Testament leading up to the coming of Christ, that's not what the Israelites wanted. The Israelites wanted someone who met their standards, someone who gave them the things that they wanted, right? Power, peace. They wanted someone to bring them away from persecution. But, as we know, God would appoint an eternal king. And so if you're in your Bible still, turn over to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, we see Jesus here is about to enter into Jerusalem. And it's right before the triumphal entry. He's around uh, lots of Jews, right? And so he's going to uh, tell these people the parable of the minas, as we find here in Luke chapter 19. And, and if you notice from this passage, you'll see it's similar to the parable of the talents. But, uh, but most people think they're two separate parables uh, because there's some distinct differences. And so Luke chapter 19, verses 11 through 14, let's read this together. As they heard these things... He proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, that's referring to his followers, he gave them ten minas and said to them, engage in business until I come. But his citizens, the Jews in this case, hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. Why? Because the Jews wanted someone who met their standards, like we talked about. Someone to bring them out of Roman captivity. Someone to bring them out of persecution and back into a peaceful state. They wanted someone who they thought was the best king. But God had other plans. Christ was the one who would instead be appointed as king. And I think the same thing applies to so many of us today. Not just us in this room, but people outside who aren't Christians. Many people aren't Christians because Christ doesn't meet their standards. Isn't that true? Many people aren't Christians because they think Christ isn't worthy of their effort. Christ isn't worth the sacrifice that they have to make in order to follow him. He's not worth the things that you have to leave behind. He's not worth the time that it's going to take and the effort you have to put in. Christ doesn't meet their standards, and because of it, they choose not to follow him. Is that you today? Is that what's holding you back from choosing him as your king? Does he meet your standards? But there's a couple problems with this perspective. And the first one's this. God appointed Christ as king. And we see from Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 9, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And see, when it came to the Israelites choosing a king, Moses was telling them, hey, man, you really want to stay away from trying to find a king that meets your standards, because I'm telling you, God's standards are going to be a lot better. There's going to be a lot more profit when you uh, choose someone who God has chosen 
over someone that meets your standards, the things that you think you need. And so if that's the same uh, with my my spiritual life, I want to choose a king. I want to choose someone to reign over me who's going to lead me in the right direction. I want to choose someone who God has appointed as king because that has to be the best king. But the second problem with this is this. Christ is still king even if you don't choose him. You look at uh, Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with Him are called and chosen and faithful. See, Christ is going to be King no matter what. And even if you don't choose Him as your King in this life, He's still going to be King after it. Christ is King no matter what. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14 says this as well. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting one which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. You want to choose him as your king because even if you don't choose to serve him in this life, even if you choose to ignore that, to to not sacrifice your life, to follow him, he's still going to be king after it. You want to choose him as your king. And so the first step in doing this is this, of course, in letting God reign in our lives, choosing him as our king. But what's the next step? And it's this. Let him change you. Because I don't think it's enough to simply choose him if nothing's going to come as a result of it. And you think about, as you think about change, you have to realize and acknowledge the fact That change is a necessary part of life, isn't it? I mean, that's just the way that life goes. If you watch enough TV, eventually you're going to have to change the remote, uh, change the batteries in the remote, right? Uh, That's just that's just how it goes. Or you think about clothes. I could probably call out some names in this room of guys who think changing clothes isn't necessary, and I can do that because I live with you, and you smell, and so. Really, changing clothes for everyone is necessary because eventually you're going to start smelling, right? Or you think about the oil in your car. If you don't change the oil in your car, eventually it's going to start having problems. There's going to be issues that come as a result. Change is just a necessary part of life. But just like being told what to do, we also tend to hate change. And that's because sometimes change isn't just uncomfortable. Sometimes change can be hurtful. Sometimes change can be hard. And I think this fact affects the way that our world's culture views Christianity. And if we're not careful, it can affect the way that we view it ourselves. And it's this. Christ accepts me and forgives me the way that I am. And I think we can all agree with that until we get to this. Then he allows me to stay the way that I am. Christianity isn't a lifestyle. The only thing that changes is instead of going to hell, I'm now going to heaven. But that's not it, is it? That's not God reigning in my life, in my kingdom. That's not him having the preeminence, affecting my decisions and the way that I live. I read a quote. It says this. I really love this. Stop trying to change the Bible when it's meant to change you. And isn't that true? Like we we have scripture so that we can look at our lives and compare it to what God says and say, am I really putting my all into following him? Am I letting what God has said in his text govern the way I live my life? That's what we got to do, not try to change scripture so that it fits to what we want, so that it fits to our standards. No, we have to stay away from that completely. And change is just such a prevalent topic in Scripture. Here's some verses if you want to write them down, if you're taking notes. Uh, But I'll go through them uh, as we look at them. Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. uh, 12 and verse 2, I'm sorry. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of myself. Nope, that's not what the verse says. What is the will of God, right? What is good and acceptable and perfect. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. 
Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, repent therefore, turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Psalm chapter 51 and verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, renew a right spirit within me. And just like that song that we sang, this is also a song, right? And just like it, it's a declaration of how we want God reigning in us to affect our lives on a day-to-day basis. Lord, change the way my heart is, change the way I view you and myself so that I can serve you and you can have the preeminence. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 is the last verse up there. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Can you say that tonight? Can you say that God is the one affecting the way you live your life? That Christ is living in you and not yourself any longer. And so I think Christianity is all about change. Once we've chosen to follow him, chosen to make him our king, change is necessary. The question becomes, well, what do I need to change? Right? Uh, we want some application when it comes to this. And so I think uh, there's, there's three things I want to call out tonight. The first one's this. Our priorities. You know, when I think about um, priorities... I think of a lot of times we talk about priorities from a standpoint of a scale. And we say, as long as these things I hold important, my job, family, uh, finances, whatever it may be, school, as long as this doesn't outweigh God, then I'm okay. But I don't think that's what Scripture tells us. And I don't think that that's what God reigning in your life is supposed to look like. I think what scripture tells us is if we put God first as our one and only priority, all these other things we're concerned about will fall right into place. All these other things we we worry about and and we we, um, spend time being anxious about, they'll be taken care of if God's the number one priority. And I think that's exactly what Matthew chapter 6 verses 31 through 33 tells us. Jesus says, therefore, do not be anxious saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these other things, they'll be added unto you. And so we have to get our priorities in check. We need to change those so that God is number one in our lives. But what else needs to change? And I think this is an important one, our identity. Not only, not only does our priorities need to change, but the way that, number one, we view ourselves and also the way others view us. And, and so as far as the way we view ourselves goes, uh, I hear a lot of times people I know I'm close to um, who are Christians, they'll say, we're all just sinners, aren't we? Uh, like, I, I sin on a day-to-day basis, and that's just who I am. Uh, that's just w- what, I can't help it, right? That, that's just what I'm left with. And they'll view themselves in this way that I think Paul wants us to stay away from. And that's what he tells us in Romans chapter 6 and verse 11. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The one who lets God reign in their kingdom, the one who lets God have the preeminence, views themselves from a standpoint of not, I belong to sin, but instead, now, I belong to Christ, right? And I think until we change our mindset and the way we we view ourselves and identify ourselves as Christians, until we change that, God isn't going to have total control. God isn't going to be the one who's reigning, And so we have to change the way we view ourselves. But we also need to change the way that others view us. And that leads us into the third thing that needs to change, our actions. If you look at 1 Peter chapter 4 and verses 3 through 4, you see this. For the time that is past suffices for what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they're surprised when you do not join in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. Can people say that about you? Do people see your actions and see the way that you live your life and say, man, I'm surprised. Something is totally different ever since this guy has 
decided to follow Christ or whatever that means, right? Something's totally different, and I want to know what that's about. The way other people view you should change, just like the way you view yourself should change. So you need to let him change you. You need to choose him as king and let him change you. And number three, you need to keep your eyes on him. <clears throat> I've done this lesson uh, before, and it seems like every time I do, I have a, a new example to talk about when it comes to driving. And tonight it was this. As I was about to pick up some of my friends uh, from the library, apparently, I, have no, I had no idea, but apparently I pulled out right in front of somebody else, and they had to slam on their brakes, all because I wasn't focused on the road. I was trying to change the music. I was trying to adjust uh, the air because I'd just gotten in the car and it was hot outside. My eyes were not focused on where they should have been. And so because of it, uh, I almost got in a wreck, apparently. I had no idea. But I think this is exactly what Scripture shows us and shows us that if we don't keep our eyes on our leader, the one who's leading us to our final destination, if we don't keep our eyes there, we're going to stray away. We're going to get distracted. And Hebrews chapter 12 tells us this if you want to turn over there. Hebrews chapter 12, I think, really um, just embraces and embodies this idea of exactly what we're talking about tonight and the progression of how that goes. And so because you've chosen him as your king, this is where it leads into verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which, sin, which clings so closely. And that's our change that we talked about, right? So you've chosen him as your king. You, you've let him change you. You've laid aside your sin, laid aside your old, old ways. And then what's the result? And let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking where? To Jesus. Looking to the one who's supposed to be reigning in your kingdom, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. If we don't keep our eyes focused on Jesus, it's going to be real easy to get distracted, isn't it? And some of you know exactly what that, what's that, what that is like. I know I can say I have. I've been there. Uh, where, where I think I have my eyes focused on Christ because I'm going to church every week, because I'm hanging around the right people. But in actuality, I'm not letting God reign in my kingdom. In actuality, my, my attention's been slightly diverted. And before I know it, I, I'm totally off the path of where I should be going. I've completely forgotten to put Christ as my number one priority, and instead, I'm worried about all these other problems that we talked about before. And it's all because I'm not keeping my eyes where they should be. So the question becomes, how do I do this? How do I keep my eyes where they need to be, focused on my leader? And I think we need to keep our eyes off of some things and keep our eyes on some things as well. So let's keep our eyes on this screen right here because that one is not working tonight. So keep your eyes off of, what do we need to keep them off of? Here's some things that, I've, uh, that I want to point out tonight. The first one's this, your fears. We need to keep our eyes off of our fears and on Jesus. So turn over to Matthew chapter 14. I love this passage. Matthew chapter 14 talks about uh, Peter, right, who is about to walk on the water. But before that happens, the apostles are in a ship, and there's about to be a storm. And so uh, Matthew chapter 14, what happens is uh, they see Jesus coming to them on the water. And here's where they, they, you know, they freak out because they, they see, they think it's a ghost, and then uh, they realize it's Jesus. And so this is where we're left in uh, verse 28. It says this, and Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? 
And so we see that Peter was filled with fear here. But if you didn't pay close attention, like I did for the majority of my life, you'll miss what I'm about to point out to you now. And it's something that's very interesting to me. If you notice, it says, Peter saw the wind. And you think about that, and you're like, well, you can't see the wind, right? I mean, you feel the effects of it. You feel it blowing against your skin. You can see the trees uh, rustling. Uh, you can hear it, right? There's many effects that the wind has on our day-to-day -day life, but you don't see the wind. It's not something you can put your eyes on. And I think a lot of times what happens with our fears is they don't even carry that much weight. Sometimes they don't even exist. It's things that we're anxious about and, and, and we're afraid of because we don't have our eyes set where they need to be. Things that wouldn't even be a problem if we just had our eyes on Christ. And that's exactly what's going on in this passage. If, if Peter had just kept his eyes on Christ, kept his trust in him and his focus, and remembered that he was his king, he was the one reigning in Peter's life, then the wind wouldn't have been a problem. He probably wouldn't have even noticed it. And so we have to keep our eyes off of our fears. But we also need to keep our eyes off of some other things. And one of those is evil things. We need to keep our eyes away from evil things. Psalm chapter 101 and verse 3 says this. It's another declaration uh, of our faith, following Christ, what it should look like, right? I love these because I feel like it strengthens me and gives me uh, an ability to have some grounding in my perspectives on things. So Psalm 101 and verse 3 says this, I will not set my eyes before anything that is worthless. I hate the work of those who fall away, and it shall not cling to me. And so you, you think about all these things that we're distracted by on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's as a result of the culture that we live in, as a result of the people we surround ourselves with, as a result of choices I make when I'm alone, all these evil things that we're distracted by, they are things that Christ has come and died for so that we could overcome and put our focus on him. And when you think about it that way, it makes me ask the question, why would I want to be involved in these things that Christ died for so that I could overcome? Uh, it makes me feel like I'm laughing in Christ's face. When I engage in these activities, when I focus on these evil things that I really should be staying away from because my eyes should instead be on Christ. We have to keep our eyes off of some evil things. And I think we also need to keep our eyes off of ourselves. We're too focused on ourselves, aren't we? And I think ultimately, tonight, this entire discussion revolves around Viewing yourself in a certain light. And that's from a prideful perspective. All of us deal with pride. All of us have issues where we view ourselves in such a way that we lift ourselves up as the king of our, of our kingdom, right? The one who reigns, the one who makes the decisions. I want to live my way, not God's way. Because I don't like being told what to do. And so instead, I'm going to be the one who makes the decisions in my life. I'm going to be the one who, who leads where my life is going, not God. And because of it, we're filled with pride. We have to keep our eyes off of ourself. Because if we're keeping our eyes on ourself and what we want, what we desire, our standards, the things that, that align with, with uh, you know, our, our views, we're not going to be able to keep our eyes on Christ. And that's one of the things that we do need to keep our eyes on. Jesus. John chapter 13, verses 14 through 15, says this, If then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you also do just as I have done for you. You know, as I think about this, Christ is saying, I've given you an example, and you can see that through Scripture, and that's just exactly how we, we do see that today, right? Right? I've given you an example so that you can become familiar with it and act more like it. And so as I think about that, I remember all, all the times that people have told me, man, you are acting just like your dad right now. 
And sometimes, you know, it's a compliment. Sometimes it's not. It depends on the situation. But because I've spent so much of my life uh, around my dad, um, engaged in a relationship with my dad, because I've spent so much time doing that, my actions reflect him. My words, the way I say things, reflect him. The way I treat others reflects the way that he has treated me as a father. And so if I really want to become familiar with Christ, really want to be able to imitate him, then I'm going to need to be able to familiarize myself with the way that he acts throughout Scripture. I'm going to need to be able to wash other people's feet like he does in this passage. I'm going to be, need to be able to sacrifice myself the way that he was so willing to come and sacrifice himself. Philippians chapter 2. I need to become like Christ. And in order to do that, and to let him reign, and to let, him, uh, to let myself become a reflection of him, I need to keep my eyes on him. And we're not going to be able to do that without Scripture. But more than that, going beyond Christ's example, we also need to imitate others who imitate Christ. You think about 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, Paul says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ, right? And this isn't Paul being cocky. This is Paul saying, I have brought you to where you are today. If you want to continue in this, continue following Christ in the way that I've dedicated myself to him, and you want to become more like Christ, then watch what I do. And so as Christians, we should be looking around for people who shed the light of Christ, people who act like him. And that's exactly what we're doing here tonight, isn't it? That's why the church is such a blessing, because I can come together multiple times throughout the week and be around these other like-minded individuals who are willing and want, and want to shed Christ's light, who want to reflect who he is. By their actions, their words, and the things that they do, we all want to reflect Christ. And so... If we're going to continue to keep our eyes on him and become more like him, we should also be keeping our eyes on those who reflect Christ. And that should also spur you on to want to be a reflection of Christ yourself so that you can, become, so that you can uh, reflect him to those around you, be an encouragement to the, your brothers and sisters here in this room. So you need to keep your eyes off of these things and on your king. And so these three, three things tonight, I think, are really um, just, just the key to letting Christ reign in our lives. And tonight, I don't know where you stand and what position you're in, but choosing him as king, I can say firsthand, was the best choice I made. And I'm sure that so many of these people here in this room would tell you the exact same thing. It's not, it's not it seems like at first... Uh, we're, we're letting go of all these things that we love and, and these things that we, we hold close, things that we value in order to follow Christ, in order to choose him and let him be our king. But after the fact of the matter, we end up loving him being our king. Uh, we end up being so grateful that we have made that choice to let him reign in our kingdom. But then after this, you need to let him change you. You need to set aside those weights. You need to be able to move on from sin, be able to follow him, and you need others to be able to see that as well. Change the way you view yourself. I don't know how you view yourself tonight. Uh, this week I've had a couple conversations with people where they've realized, man, I, I've been viewing myself in a way that doesn't reflect what Christ has made me to be. And it's because of this. They viewed themselves as sinners. And so if you need to change your identity the way you view yourself, then I encourage you to do that tonight. View yourself as, as one who Christ has made, um, made his own. View yourself as one who lets Christ reign in you. But we don't only need to let him change us. We have to continue in this. We've got to keep our eyes on him. We've got to let him be a reflection in our lives. And if we're going to do that, then we have to be able to know who he is, know what he wants from us, and the way that he acted in his life, and become a reflection of that. And also, we need to imitate our brothers and sisters. And so tonight, 
as we move on from this study, I really just hope that you can be able to, next time you sing that song, Lord, Reign in Me, be able to focus on the words and say, this applies to my life. This applies to who I am as a Christian and the choice that I've made to let him reign in me. Stand,